We are officially recording. Thank you so much for taking your time to join us today. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Christy Fair, and I'm an experienced architect at Salesforce. Um, I've been here about six months. Just want to introduce myself. I go by she, her pronouns. And for anyone that might not be able to see me today, I am wearing a white shirt. I'm a white female located in Austin, Texas, with short, light brown, reddish hair, and lots of freckles. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you today, based on my experience, experience the difference between a product manager and a user experience designer. So um, yeah, it looks like Miriam is our um, facilitator with ADP List, and she's going to be facilitating any questions coming in on the chat. We'll ask everyone else to remain muted, if that's cool, and at the end do a Q&A. Now, Miriam is having some challenges with um, Wi-Fi issues right now. It's raining where she is. It's actually writing where I am, which is very exciting. We need it. Um, but if for some reason there's a disconnection on her end, I'll facilitate as much as I can at the end. And um, and if nothing else, we can connect offline. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so today I'm going to go over a high level overview of UX design, what it is, why we do it, and how we do it, as well as product management, what it is, why we do it, how we do it, and then product synergy together how we can all work together to improve our products. Before just jumping in, just wanna give you a little bit of a background of myself. Um, I am personally a very enthusiastic product designer that loves solving complex problems. I love taking very complex problems and trying to simplify, creating an enjoyable experience um, that's very user-centric. Um, so just over here, you might've seen if you played ever, already the um, shoots and ladders as a kid. Um, I personally play with my family at home, but I have that in here to just illustrate what my career has looked like. It's not been a straightforward path where everything's been fabulous and easy by any means. Um, you'll see over here in the upper right, I went to Texas A&M College of Architecture for my undergrad. So for my first 12 years, I actually um, practiced architecture. So building design, residential design, and then um, retail and restaurant design. And love the career, but as you might guess, um, volatility in the market. I graduated shortly after 9-11 years ago, so not dating myself, um, but then also experienced like the downturn of the economy, 2008, 2009. So I hit a lot of doors closed in my face and or just experienced continuous increasing responsibilities and lack of increasing pay rates. So at the end, when you're considered like a senior designer and you're not really making an income that's going to be able to potentially support a family and or the dreams and the life that I wanted to live, I started realizing, hey, I think it's time for a change, especially when my last architecture job, my um, boss closed his doors. Unfortunately, after opening a company for 40 years, lack of work, um, the last six months were stressful because every day I walked into the office and we didn't know if we were going to have work the next day. So I've been on this side where there is a lack of demand and a lack of need when you're really passionate about something also. So it was a hard breakup for me, almost like a divorce, if you will, um, leaving the field of architecture. But I knew that I needed to make a change in my life and wanted to make a change. Um, it was postponing dreams of even having a family on my end and um, wanted just a brighter future. So I started my MBA at Texas State University. I'm located in Austin, Texas. And um, kind of blindly, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I went to every class and they're like, who here hasn't taken finance? And I would be like the only sole person in the room. Having been um, an architecture major, I mean, I mainly took like art classes and AutoCAD <laughs> so, and construction classes. So I hadn't taken finance, economics, marketing, you name it. I think I was the only one in every single class that's like, never taken it, never taken it. So I joke that at that time, that was 2014, so eight years ago, um, I transitioned from bricks to clicks. And I knew that being in the um, tech hub uh, that Austin is that I wanted to transition to something in the tech industry, but I didn't know exactly what. So I started trying to put together my parallel project management skills as an architect with some of these project management skills in the tech industry. And not many people were kind of feeling that parallel um, that I was other than Q2. I ended up working at Q2 for seven and a half years. Um, I started there as an intern. So imagine someone in their 30s trying to make major career steps. I actually like had to take a lot of steps back. So I compare the shoots and ladders. Um, I was interning in my 30s. I joked with my husband one night when I came home crying with braces, like, what am I doing with my life? 
But I realized that sometimes to take a lot of steps forward in life, you got to take some steps backwards and a humble beginnings. You got to start somewhere, right? And change can be hard. I personally love change and embrace change, but going backwards can be challenging. Um, but when I went from bricks to clicks at Q2, I actually started as a project manager in implementations. Um, I didn't love the job, but I loved the company and I loved the mission. They're a very community driven mission based company that supports community and regional banks and credit unions and loved their mission, knew that I wanted to stay in the industry, but not sure exactly what. And then we had a speaker come in that talked about UX design. And right when I saw heard about UX design being the combination of, for one, design and solving complex problems, but then also user interface design and um, taking those business problems to create valuable products. I was like, that is what I want to do. And so I was the squeaky wheel. Um, squeaky wheel gets the grease. I asked for what I wanted over and over to try to get onto the product team, the UX design team, I should specify, at Q2. And eventually I did. Like I said, I had, I had to work my way down and up, going from a senior designer in architecture to the lowest of the totem pole to work my way up was challenging, um, but there are many parallel skills from architecture to UX design that I've been able to apply. I've joked that I had to call it from inches to um, pixels and you know um, various nomenclature. A lot of parallel skills in regards to the design thinking process, um, but that's where how I've gotten to where I am today. In my journey at Q2, I was a product designer for a long duration on a product team and started leaning in more to the product strategy part. Then we had an opportunity when the pandemic hit and were growing for me to start managing the development team. So I actually became a UX designer turned software engineer manager and product manager. So I was managing developers and a QA, felt a little over my head. Um, I've never coded myself. So, um, but we knocked out some amazing progress and projects and were able to deliver a lot of value to our clients at that time together. So I learned on the spot product management, loved it and enjoyed it. Admittedly for that year and a half, um, I did hit the burnout stage. I mean, that was middle pandemic and stuff. So not, like I said, my path hasn't been a smooth, joyful ride, but I love where I am today. And when I hit the burnout, I just realized I'd gotten a little too far removed from the product design aspect that I personally love so much and find a lot of joy in. And so that's what triggered me just seeing if other opportunities were about. And then um, I was able to, by a former MBA colleague of mine, find out that there were opportunities at Salesforce and was able to um, get a job here in early January, and I'm loving my journey here so far. Definitely a whole different experience in regards to the scale. Salesforce has 75,000 employees, as you might know. So even as designers, we have like 250 plus um, designers. So I went from a team of what originally was like 10 designers, we had tripled in size, which I thought was significant, to now 250. So it's pretty drastic. Um, a few other minor things about me, you'll see here just these, um, these little, I don't know if you've seen those folded fortune cookies that are almost origami-like. Um, I am a mother of two girls and um, a wife of 15 years, and we love being creative at our house, encouraging um, our girls to always problem solve and create new things, whether we're doing Art Hub for Kids on YouTube or um, creating new things. So that's just um, spending some family time making crafts. ADP list, I started mentoring a year ago. When I made that career transition back in 2014, I wish there was a platform like this um, with that ambiguity and um, uncertainty about where I was heading just to even talk to people because so much about what we do as UX designers even is leaning in and doing research and discovery. And had I had that opportunity to potentially um, meet with mentors or more experienced designers myself, I might have been able to even identify what I want to do earlier in my career. So I love to help and assist with junior designers or anyone actually at any stage of their career, because we can always learn something from each other. I learned just as much from the folks that I've met with as they might have learned from myself. And then in the bottom right, I just put this because I am spending a lot of time outside of work right now. I just started a new Girl Scout troop. Um, Sounds like a little feat, but it is actually very significant. And now I know why a lot of people don't want to start one. Um, and it is probably one of the most challenging user experiences of starting a new Girl Scout troop. So um, I'm putting a lot of my own professional practice skills to play when it comes to the personal part of um, leading a Girl Scout troop of 29 girls between the age of kindergarten and second grade. So whew, um, it's, it's fun and I'm excited to give back and start new adventures with them this year. 
So in regards to UX design, just a high level, what is it? Well, it's really the interaction between real users, like you and I, every day. I'm sure we're all on our phone. I mean, we're all here in Zoom, so oh, you can't see it because of my background thing. Um, Every day we're using different products and different services. It, UX design is beyond just the interface. So I just wanna mention that it's not just an interface on an application, but it's the entire product and service. Um, I'm sure we could all sit here and have um, hours of happy hours talking about bad experiences that we've experienced at some point in our life. Um, other times it's a delightful experience. Like I've become a big fan of Target's pickup process. If you have a last minute something you need to buy and you can go do a pickup and then drive up and they can enable your location and bring it out to your car. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and when you're living a busy life, managing a family and a full-time career. So um, putting the users at the center of the design with so many variables is what allows us to deliver great, enjoyable experiences. So um, here's a little circle showing all of the variations of what's involved in user experience design. And they all play critical parts like content strategy. I mean, um, you can think back to, I forgot what year it is, but the um, in Hawaii, they had the, unfortunately the alert that a missile was going off because someone accidentally hit the test button that sent an alert automatically to all of the Hawaiian residents. Um, mainly because the content was not intuitive to actually say this is a test. It also wasn't under a couple like multi-factor authentications where someone should have access to the actual launch. Um, so things like that can actually like really impair not just an experience, but even the, um, put someone in a threatening situation like that. Typography does matter just so you even know what you are clearly doing. If you want to ask someone, do save or don't save? Are you canceling this? Um, being very clear so that it's a usable, easy, effortless experience. Um, I also threw in some memes and some quotes today. So even if some of this is all a repeat of something that you've already at one point in your life already experienced, um, also, I do want to apologize. Apparently, there are a handful of people waiting off to the side for entry. So um, welcome for those of you that are late. Um, apologies, I didn't realize that I needed to admit you in. <laughs> so um, hopefully today, even if everything I um, go over with you is a repeat of stuff that you already know, hopefully you walk away a little bit inspired about something in your career or have a little smile from some sort of meme or a quote that just sticks with you. I feel like if if you go anywhere in life and spend some time and walk away with one little token that sticks in your mind, it was worth that time. So I hope it is valuable enough for you today. Um, when thinking about the difference of user interface and user experience design, I personally in my career here at Salesforce and at Q2 um, do both. So I know some people think that that should be two, those should be two separate disciplines, um, but it also depends on where you work and what the resourcing is and how you're put on a product and or project team. And in my situation, I've been doing both. So leading the UX part, all of the research from the beginning to the user flows, the journeys, the walking through everything to then also designing the interface at the end and validating with users. So you're constantly getting that feedback loop. So I love this meme just because the UI of a pretty fancy ketchup bottle and glass where you have to turn it around and hit it even though it's not flexible is definitely not as usable as the upside down where the content inside the ketchup bottle is already easily accessible. And then you can simply squeeze it and get it out. Um, so as per the um, infamous Steve Jobs said, design isn't just what it looks like and feels like, but it's how it works. Try to also give some credit to all of the images that I copied. This is one of my favorite images that I have actually, what's funny back in my architecture days before I even knew about the term user experience, we talked about this in architecture school where one college campus actually decided not to um, put down and pave pathways because they wanted to see where all of the students walked, which I thought was genius because then they found where all of the paths went and then they decided to go ahead and, um, and put the pathways in. So you'll see here, I'm sure we've seen it before. I saw it at my kids' school yesterday. Everyone was not following the um, sidewalk. They were actually walking on their own path. And that just shows the difference of you can design something, but if you don't have the users in mind, it might not be the you weren't solving the right problem. 
Um, this is also a favorite. Um, you've probably seen this meme on LinkedIn or somewhere, but the difference of user interface and user experience. This mobile is super cute looking from above, but when you actually look at the user, the baby, um, they don't have the best view. So why does UX design matter? Well, um, the bottom line is that it impacts the bottom line directly. Companies that invest in leveraging design actually see higher returns. And so they see an improvement of organizational alignment across their business, increased product usage, increased revenue, competitive advantage. They reduce the support costs and ultimately increase customer satisfaction, which is probably keeping your customer retention rate coming back and returning over and over again. So I do love this quote also from the CEO of Jaguar and Land Rover. If you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design. So I know sometimes um, resources are impacted, and I don't know if you're like me, but I've been on a dev team where we've had three or four developers and only one designer where there's a major um, dev dependency on design and a backlog for developers waiting on design. But when they chose not to invest in design, that's when there are definitely risks involved. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, how you do design on an agile sprint team. So how do we do it? Well, transformation really does move faster with design thinking. If you are on a product team that has never done user experience design, and then you add it in, yes, you might have to take a little bit of a step backwards, but kind of like I mentioned, even in comparison to my career path, you have to take a few steps backwards to take many strides forwards. And so ultimately when you apply the design thinking methodology and start with the experience and then work backwards to the technology, you can drive that adoption and return on your investment. This is um, kind of a pinwheel circle, if you will, of the design thinking process. So starting with discovery, that's how we always wanna start as user experience designers um, and product managers. So we'll get into that momentarily. But as user experience designers, the discovery is so important. So you can really look at the, what are the problems we're trying to solve? In discovery, I always highly suggest to talk to not only the stakeholders involved, those key team members between your customer and or if you're an internal product team, um, to talk to them, what are their goals of this project? How do they define success? What do they think they're trying to solve? Sometimes you find that they are aligned and other times you definitely find that they are not. And it's um, very telling. Then also performing discovery with either contextual inquiries going on site. These days we're very remote, right? I'm working from my house right now. This is a fake background, um, but I'm personally conducting the majority of all of these interviews over Zoom and um, Google Meet and everyone can share their screens these days. So there is a beauty of also this um, work wherever you are, um, society we're living in these days. But with the discovery aspect, finding out what, um, what the users are expecting, what their pain points are, what's working for them right now, and maybe even the potential ideas they have. Um, but sometimes you find, I had some interviews last week where they weren't mentioning anything as pain points. They didn't say anything directly in that. So I highly recommend always having a very vetted user um, interview guide, even from the product management standpoint when you're performing discovery and asking things in different ways that are non-biased, um, but also just asking you to walk someone to walk you through their current process, show you, like actually watch them do something like a contextual inquiry, because you'll find that even though they might have not said it is a challenge, that we find that humans tend to adapt to their environment. So um, especially newer employees tend to notice these greater challenges because it's new to them. Whereas someone who's been somewhere five to 10 years, they're just used to how annoying it is to have to go to JIRA, to Confluence, to this, to this, to copy paste, to this, this, where it, maybe it doesn't need to be that complicated. From the discovery phase, taking all of that information and synthesizing it. I have this monster mirror board I'm working in right now and I love it. Mirror is an amazing hands-on whiteboarding tool that's collaborative that lots of people can get into. Um, but really breaking that down, that discovery analysis down and synthesizing it into themes and opportunities. Opportunities, how might we? Um, potentially defining how you might um, solve that problem, but not necessarily already solutioning at that point, but defining the personas, who are the team, who are the players involved in this workflow that we're trying to improve? And um, you'll find sometimes there are various components and really the ultimate user experience is 
targeting all of the personas to make sure they all together cohesively have a positive journey and experience. Taking all of that information in and then actually starting the design aspect with low fidelity wireframes, I always suggest to start lo-fi so you don't feel so committed. Um, currently I'm using Figma, previously used Axure. Um, I love the interactive prototyping tools myself. I know Sketch is an awesome tool as well, but I love that it's already baked in where you can already have it interactive. So going from the low fidelity to easily transition to high fidelity, creating an interactive prototype where you can then test right in front of your users um, and immediately finding quickly what didn't work or what did work. Um, then one thing that I think that sometimes user experience design doesn't focus on as much as the delivery aspect and deployment. That's where having been on the product manager side, I think one of the reasons why I thrived in transitioning to that is because I liked to deliver things. I didn't want to just design something and have it sit there. I wanted to see it in the user's hands and not just in their user's hands. I wanted to continue to get that feedback loop. Just because you did um, test something in usability testing and do this workflow and that isolated workflow and get user feedback and it might work at that moment, when you actually then expand out to the real life production scenario, you might realize that that solution is not the right solution. I have experienced that before because it wasn't in a cohesive environment. When they performed usability testing, that workflow worked great as a fragmented siloed experience, as an experience holistically with everything else, pivot, pivot, we had to um, be agile on our feet to true definition. So um, the design thinking process can definitely help you get there, but it is a full circle, just kind of coming back, rinse, repeat, constantly going back to discovery, then defining, designing, delivering, and the deploying is being an integral part of the product team to help get something out into production. So another thing on how we do it and from the UX design perspective is focusing on all things experience. Just want to mention that it is beyond just the interface. It's so much about the process. Sometimes we find that just the backdoor process of how something's being executed might not be the most optimal process. Um, like I mentioned, I'm sure we can all pinpoint some app that we've been on that is just very frustrating because it might not be integrated elsewhere. Um, but really thinking of that holistic journey and how the process defined to execute something impacts also that experience. Um, so striving for a user-centric alignment, adoption, and action. Um, I highly recommend if you aren't already to just subscribe for the NNG Nielsen Norman Group um, weekly incoming, I guess, email that they do. I believe it's every Monday, but I learn a ton from them. I've also been to some of their trainings. Um, highly respect them. Um, am no way affiliated with them, but this is their um, design thinking 101 process, which is kind of a different approach from what I showed earlier, but the empathizing, that's the discovery, then the defining, ideation, that's the designing part, turn into prototyping, turn into testing, validating with our users, and I always like to say usability testing instead of user testing, because we aren't ever testing the user, we're testing the usability of the solution that we're trying to put out there and then implementing. And I love that it constantly brings it back to the beginning, because like I said, you might find out you implemented something and you're like, oh, back to the drawing board, pivot, pivot, pivot. Um, so the beauty about working on an agile team is that you can fail fast and work together as um, a cohesive product team. In regards to also how we do it, I wanna mention the working model of an agile and UX process team. I highly recommend having been a UX designer turned product manager back to now um, UX design, I guess my title's experience architect at um, Salesforce. Just wanna mention that that's more like a creative lead that's also leading product strategy, but also the UX and the UI. So kind of the whole gamut of the, of the actual design element. Um, so the working model of agile and UX, getting UX involved early to help define that target state for the future experience. Like I mentioned a while ago, finding that ideal North Star future experience and working your way backwards to find out how you can um, launch incremental value. Then also including them in all of the product team's agile ceremonies. I truly believe that UX product management and the lead dev should be like besties. Like they should be like hand in hand talking on the daily and uh, representing UX work on user stories and tagging any tickets. Like I personally, and 
um, by best practices from my own experience, have worked in JIRA and or now we're doing Azure DevOps on my current project um, where we have design tickets. So there's always transparency into what the UX designer is working on, what we are projecting to come up, but then also being flexible enough to pivot where needed. Having recurring design reviews, um, I suggest holding them weekly. That way there's never a question as to what decisions are we making. There's complete transparency and team collaboration um, for everyone to be able to see, hey, these are the ideas I'm pitching. How might this work? Why wouldn't it work? Getting that dev input earlier, the sooner the better, um, so that you can find out what may or may not work. I'm gonna just do a quick time check. We're about halfway through, um, which is perfect. Um, I'm about two thirds of the way through the deck and then we'll have some Q&A. Also empowering user, re user experience to reach out to stakeholders and users for research and usability testing. This is crucial. Um, I really think to have a great product, you need buy-in from everyone, the stakeholders and users and the product team. And personally, I've hit some barriers to entry in regards to not being able to access stakeholders or users um, on a previous project I've worked on where I was just given a task list to execute on. And I did have to push back and say, hey, that's not user experience design. That is basically me being a graphic designer and or user interface design. But if someone is saying that they want human-centered design, we need to talk to the humans. We need the human buy-in we need to be able to do discovery. So um, just really understanding the process to know that, hey, this is a collaborative team effort. Though the user experience designer might be the one executing on the deliverables, it really is a collaborative um, team effort in regards to the deliverables that you move forward with. And that last bullet point is just saying that UX product and dev lead, um, very close, very good relationships are crucial. Here are just a few sample deliverables for UX, how we do it. The customer insights, um, I was talking about customer and I guess I should really say stakeholder and user insights here. Um, the persona that I was talking about, all of that synthesis from the research to then be able to take that to a journey map and say, hey, these are the various personas. This is how they should interact with each other. And this is the ideal state of the journey. Before you go into UX wireframing and interactive proto designs, and from there, before the dev handoff, I like to work very closely with my devs. Um, generally speaking, I've been um, lucky enough to have a design library where I can just point them to the component. But I've also been on the side of helping create that design library where you might have to provide detailed specs so that they know exactly what hex code, hover code, um, hex hover state, I guess all the things from the pixels, how big something should be, the font types, you name it. If you don't have a consistent design library, highly suggest it so that it'll help refrain from having to do detailed designs every single time. It also creates consistency and then your devs can create consistent components that can just be reused and modified as needed. So that was a lot on UX design. Now transitioning to product management. So what is product management? Well, this is the intersection of business technology and UX. So bringing it all together to strategically drive the vision of a company's products. So this is the long-term, where are we going? What are we hearing from so many resources? Product management um, is hearing it from every direction, from finance, support, sales, marketing, customer success. Um, and then also trying to remain competitive against the whole entire uh, macro landscape out there for products that are similar. So kind of love some of these uh, memes again, but here's a product manager, um, I'd say herding the cats, um, and these literally are kittens, um, having sales, marketing, business development, clients, all coming together to basically provide their inputs. And so I kind of love this Mona Lisa just showing, hey, this is the MVP, the skim down version of what we hope to um, launch. And then these are goals, market needs, all of the different factors um, and what you actually launch. And then where you go back to the drawing board and you continue to iterate and iterate and iterate. And I'm sure we all know you can't climb in a mountain in a day. You can't boil the ocean. So you have to take that massive product roadmap and break it down in incremental deliverables so that you can deliver value um, for users, but continue to build upon that. I think that's actually crucial for a successful product delivery. Um, also love this, Leonardo DiCaprio and Wal 
Wolf of Wall Street, I think it is. Uh, but when people suggest the improvements for the product, I tell them I put in the backlog, but never do. So if you're like some of my product teams have been, we were always like, oh, that's on the roadmap. But really taking that feedback into consideration of how might you actually put in the roadmap and working together very closely with the UX designer is crucial to find out like what is really valuable for the users. Is this or is this the loudest client barking in the room because they don't have that one feature they want when all the other clients would value take, you know, benefit from another smaller feature. It's definitely a balancing act at every moment. Um, speaking of balancing act in regards to why product management matters, because they are creating that north arrow vision of where the product is heading, um, balancing almost like plate spinning, like the picture shows here, um, balancing the sales, the prioritization of what would be valuable to get out into production, um, working with the development team to prioritize that. Um, also, one huge factor, if you're net new and putting out a brand new product, you don't have to worry about support and maintenance. But once it's out in production, you got to worry about, okay, now we have something in production, but we want to keep up our momentum of delivering new product features. But then you're also supporting anything if it breaks and or has bugs and it's inevitable, code does. And so you have to factor in that happy balance of maintaining and supporting what's out there, but also staying in a competitive advantage to delivering value. And so a product manager, um, and I've given all image credits in the bottom of these slides. Um, so this particular one's from Product Board. There are so many different product resources out there. Also, Product School is a great one. Um, but they wear multiple hats at any time. Their ultimate goals are to understand, like what is the problem they are trying to solve? So they're kind of like a psychologist. I joke sometimes after a discovery session, um, it feels like it was a therapy appointment for some of the users or stakeholders because they got a lot off their chest that they feel that um, has been bugging them for a while and they almost feel a little refreshed. Like, yeah, I feel like someone listened to me. Um, a detective also really digging in to understand again, what are the issues here? What are we trying to solve? and almost like a scientist. Then strategizing, being that creative director of the product um, direction, where they're heading, and a diplomat, as well as an architect, trying to figure out how to define, organize, and prioritize the solution so that they can ultimately get this out to for users to use and drive results. And then also rallying the troops. They're like a coach. They probably do need a whistle at any time. An ER doctor, as you, you probably heard, firefighters as well, constantly putting out fires, um, and a gardener, like sowing the seeds and putting them and watching them grow, but then also maintaining that harvest that is already out there before they have to go replant again. So um, lots of metaphors here, but product managers do a lot. And, um, and personally, I really enjoyed my journey as a product manager, but like I mentioned to you, I stepped a little too far away from my love and passion for design, and so that's why I went back to design. Um, this particular one is not a roadmap of mine. Just want to show that this is an example of a roadmap. Product managers at any given time, I personally strongly feel that you should always have absolute transparency into a roadmap, even if it's a disclaimer, asterisk, asterisk, subject to change at any given moment. But this at least says we have a vision. We know where we're heading. This is our North Star arrow at this given moment. It might change tomorrow based on, I mean, as we know, life can change in 2020, all of our lives changed with COVID and um, shutdowns everywhere. So, um, but at least having that long-term vision and then the short-term milestones, how you plan to achieve to get to that vision, but being flexible enough as an agile development team to be able to pivot and modify. Um, so bringing it all together for product strategy, like how do the product designers, so UX designers, work together with product management and um, the dev side. So together, they um, focus on relationships, focusing on the relationship from the process to the data and the technology from the start. So we want those human-centered insights always at the forefront, <coughs> excuse me, as well as um, to be feasible, like what can we do? At Salesforce, I'm still learning a lot, um, but we have out-of-the-box capabilities that I'm able to tell our customers, this is what we can do out-of-the-box. 
and configure it. But this is what we're going to do from a custom standpoint to achieve that um, ultimate user experience that you want. But then there's a the trade-off of value versus effort and having those conversations. How long will it take from a dev standpoint? Um, do they want to maintain custom code? So there are a lot of trade-offs that constant communication needs to be happening um, as to achieve product synergy between UX product management, so making sure that you're achieving the business goals and the technical feasibility of everything. I also just want to break down when we bring it all together, who does what. I put together here different columns of product managers because they're more on the strategic side, that market fit for the features, like the what and why behind what we're doing, performing market research and prioritization, and really um, owning and running that roadmap and strategy. Product owners, on the other hand, it does depend obviously where you work and um, how big and complex your organization is. I'm used to these being two separate jobs, but sometimes they have merged together. Um, but product owners are a little more tactile in regards to um, managing the granular details of each feature, of working together very strongly with UX designers and even business analysts for those requirement definitions so that they can put together a JIRA ticket that's very bullet pointed, like those devs know exactly what to go execute on. So afterwards, it's almost like a checklist, like they know exactly what they were supposed to build. And um, maintaining that product backlog, that's a big one in itself. That's like a full-time job, typically. <laughs> Whereas user experience designers um, typically cover both the strategic and tactile area, where they're um, focusing on the user journey and an intuitive interface, the how we're going to deliver this value to our clients between workflows, design, and user research. And then also, um, from my experience as a user experience designer, I highly suggest leaning into that product strategy, not just executing what a product manager or owner tells you to execute on, but leaning into the taking and synthesizing that discovery and taking that information to say, how might we change this and improve this product by doing X, Y, Z based on the data we received from this survey or these users. I'm also maintaining design style guides and the user personas, like constantly bringing back the any product decision to really come back to a user persona, the why which we decided on this moving forward because it impacts this user in this way. And I do want to just joke because I've been on the side of the product manager, but also on the design team. And I loved this when I saw it on LinkedIn. I don't have the exact um, link, but just when a design team member, um, I'm sure at some point you've had a product owner or manager pull out paint or something and say, hey, since you were busy, I made a little mock up myself. And sometimes it's like, oh, please don't. But at the end of the day, everyone really true at heart is a designer. We are solving problems, right, um, together. Now, the design aspects obviously um, have various, I guess, layers and variability to them. Um, but it is funny whenever someone, a product manager tries to jump in and design. Um, so uh, suggested takeaways for today. I know we have about 18 minutes left. And uh, these are just some pointers I'd like to share with you based on my personal career journey um, that I think to um, not only thrive in the UX design world or product manager world, or just in general, um, I'd love to just share a few takeaways. So I saw this the other day. It was actually just on the 16th of August on um, LinkedIn. Someone had shared someone's tweet to be a Kermit the Frog. For those of you that might not know, that's Kermit the Frog. Um, to have a creative vision and no ego. Recognize the unique talents of those around you and attract weirdos, manage chaos, show kindness, and be sincere. I'm all about embracing diversity. Um, I don't want people that are just like me on my team because then we wouldn't be creative. We wanna embrace our variances so that we can come together and solve problems from different angles. Um, I also love Brene Brown's comment to stay awkward. Um, I know I'm a big dork and love um, just having a good time on my product team. Um, be brave and kind. Also take initiative. I find that this is not that common actually. Um, throughout my entire career, I have found that it is very rare for people to take initiative, to find a problem that isn't being solved somewhere. And uh, if you're really wanting to, um, I guess, grow in your career, it's not, handouts don't just happen. I definitely learned that from my um, showing you my shoots and ladders journey in my own career. Um, the only way that I've been able to take 
panel of my career is um, not expecting anything to happen to me, but making it happen for myself and taking that initiative, leaning in beyond your swim lane. I think that's really important. Too many people are like, oh, that's not part of my job. Well, then you're probably not going to grow a lot in your career. So if you want to really grow and thrive, um, leaning in, working and collaborating with your teammates, being a great teammate putting in the work. I'm finding sometimes some newer junior designers are just expecting to be a senior within a year. And um, sorry, I mean, I've actually put in 20 years of my career and I'm like just getting there. So I feel like you got to put in the time, you got to put in the work, you got to be able to be an intern in your thirties if that's what it takes to make the change and not be afraid to make the change if that's what you're wanting. Also seeking to understand the why, asking a lot of questions to understand like, why are we doing it this way? Um, not just taking it because a company says that's what we have to do. Well, why? Why do we have to do that? Who decided that? At some point, it might have just been someone's lazy decision or a quick rash decision because they didn't want to invest the time to do it right the first time. I found, um, I put on here, repeat yourself, and then I repeat it again, repeat yourself. Um, I heard this from one of my um, former managers that I have the utmost respect for. She's just an amazing, badass UX director. And she taught me once that we can be in meetings over and over and over and say the same things. And sometimes you might say it six times and someone only picked it up that one time. And so if you really feel strongly about a product where I know right when I just feel very strongly that there is a workload that I feel that we're missing, um, not being afraid to rinse and repeat, repeat, repeat at every meeting. Hey, if we really considered this, this might create value here. Um, because sometimes someone might finally hear you and actually decide, hey, that's the direction we should go. Not being afraid to fail fast, taking that risk, being brave, being courageous and putting yourself on the line. So much of design is pitching ideas. I'm told on the daily that might not be a great idea, but you know what? We at least put out there something that um, a possible direction, how we could go, because not everything's going to stick, only the right thing sticks. And we'll find, I mean, nothing in life is easy. If everything was easy, we'd all be successful, right? So um, being able to embrace that challenge and ask for what you want again and again. So like I mentioned, I got onto the UX design team because I was that squeaky wheel, that um, squeaky wheel gets the grease when I got into Q2 and realized what I want to do. I was a project manager for a year, did not love being a project manager. I have co the complete utmost respect for implementation project managers now. Um, <laughs> Getting yelled at by clients for things beyond your control that you couldn't control is actually really challenging. And I didn't like being in that position. So I wanted to be on the problem solving side where I could help fix those issues. But it gave me that complete empathy for the whole implementation team. So now when I deploy products, I want to make sure that the it should be an easy experience for the implementation team. They're part of the user experience also. So thinking of the holistic journey from every, um, every different experience. So those are, that's everything I wanted to talk about today from my personal journey of being a UX designer turned product manager and back to UX design, but still running product strategy. Um, I hope it was insightful for you. And I will see if Miriam has an internet connection and if she's able to facilitate the Q&A. And if not, I will, I can lead it. Okay, thanks for everyone's time today. Miriam, are you available by chance to do the Q&A? Okay, I don't think she is. So I'm going to look through the chat and just see if I can go through some of these. I know we're about 13 minutes out. I am all about respecting everybody's time um, for direct stop, for um, hard stops. I personally have meetings right after this also. Um, so just want to mention, oh, thank you. Someone's from Los Angeles. Welcome. Been there, done the same thing. Love it. Bricks to clicks. Um, you used that quote in a presentation. Awesome. I'm not sure which quote. Yeah, NNG. Thank you, um, Mukesh. I hope you're, I'm saying your name right. But I love the NNG um, article. I think that's a great reference. And i um, glad you like the images, Stephanie. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is Cindy Angelo. I can help with Q&A. Where are we at? We're just uh, oh, starting all the questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going through the chat right now, Cindy. Um, and I'm Amazing. on the like, 
1040 a.m. from Bao, um, where would you say product designers fit versus um, product managers in UX? I do feel that there's, it depends on how your organizational structure is for smaller companies. Um, like really the overall, in my humble opinion, and I know that some people might um, disagree and I'm all about challenges as well, um, but product design really should cover user experience design and user interface design and research. And so that I think really UX is covered within product designers that work hand in hand with product managers. Um, if a product owner has no technical background at all, I'm hoping, um, I believe it's Chewy asked that. I hope I'm saying her name right. Um, if a product owner has no technical background at all, that's where I would suggest to have a mentor, whether it's a product manager or owner or business analyst that could help them define those product requirements. Um, I had to lean in when we had a gap of a product owner, which is actually why I leaned more in when I was a user experience designer to product and helped create our backlog because we had an interim where we didn't have one, a product owner. And that's actually what kind of drove me into being in the, um, in the position I was in. Um, but from the design aspect, I would actually help create those user stories and, um, and organize the backlog in the suggested priority when we didn't have that gap and filled in a lot of the blanks. That's such a good idea, Christy. And then I don't know if this is something you are uh, familiar with, but one question from Abhishek is, are product designers and product managers paid equally, uh, equally well at startups or uh, FAANG companies? That is a great question. Um, thank you, Abhishek. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, from my experience, where I previously was, yes, they are in parallel with each other, um, depending on the, I guess, the seniority rank, you know, um, the experience and whatnot. But yes, generally speaking, they are hand in hand. Amazing. Um, and then I know we have a few questions of whether or not the copy of the presentation will be available. Um, we do have the recording that's going to be available on ADP List's website. I don't think the actual slides will be. Uh, so definitely, if you took any screenshots, you can uh, use those. Or if you have any questions, you feel free to connect with us directly uh, on LinkedIn. Um, let me see. What's the next question here? Uh, what do you do when product managers, account directors just don't listen to you? <laughs> they ask for your opinion, but never use the ideas. Thanks for this question, Karma. Karma, that's a great question. I've definitely had that happen to myself over and over and over. <laughs> um, <laughs> hence my repeat, even when I know that it's not necessarily being listened to. But I think that there is a you know professional way you can do it in regards to pinpointing the risks involved. If you do not go this way, we just... Um, have a hypothesis that this could be a risk, potential lack of product adoption. For example, um, where I previously worked, we were encouraged to um, put something out when it didn't feel like it was ready to get out. And um, we also knew that our customers were frustrated having already waited for a product deployment for a very long duration. So putting it out, my hypothesis was they're going to be a little more frustrated because it's not a fully vetted, like great MVP. And so now they're going to have to toggle back and forth between two products. That ended up being the case. We at least mentioned it but it was a combination of value versus effort versus like, we got to start somewhere. You can't boil the ocean. And we decided to deliver that incremental value and just have a small user early adopter base, start with the product and production. And the more um, features we added on, the more adoption increased and the less we're using the legacy products, more using the new product. And over time, we've also did a lot of research to discover which workflows are being mostly used in this legacy product to get those out of the legacy product and into the new product. And that's what started building our product adoption. So I had a lot of apprehension saying, this is not a good enough product to put out there. Like it's kind of embarrassing, but you also have to start somewhere. And so um, the give and take of having those hard conversations, but also always pointing out the risks involved um, and repeating yourself, I think is important. Yeah, that's great. Um, Joe asks, what will you do if you get on the bad side of the boss's stakeholder, if you keep repeating yourself? Um, I'm not sure if this was in regards to a specific slide that you had presented or or just in general. 
Um, that's a good question. I've never experienced anyone truly getting on the bad side unless they just don't have a great attitude and aren't mm -hmm. more, if they're only talking and not listening. I've experienced that before. So I do think you need to be respectful and listening to the bosses and stakeholders as well. Um, and then from a, like a design and product standpoint, I think you can put together a vision of this is the ideal state where we think we should head, but based on the, cr the criteria you gave us, this is where we think we should go. Here's a gap analysis of the risks involved of going this way versus this way, because there are always trade-offs. And then, um, if you go in the way that the executives or bosses are telling you to go, um, just always having that, um, knowing that there were some trade-offs and, also continuing to do research to maybe potentially be able to pitch again um, that idea later down the road. Got it. And then um, Mangal Kumar asks, do you recommend any courses for product management? Yes, I highly recommend um, Product School. Um, I love their courses. I also follow um, the Carlos, I forgot his last name, on LinkedIn. And they do like Product Con. Um, once or even twice a year now. Personally, I found great insights from them. Um, there are so many different, I guess, mediums out there, but that's one that I would highly suggest. And actually, Michael asks a similar question. Um, did an MBA help you in your career or was there any specific literature that helped you in your current position? So I'm guessing literature-wise that course, or maybe there's a specific book. Um, yes, Michael, my MBA did help in that that's what kind of triggered me to start an internship, which was hard um, at that point in my life in general. I still remember they asked myself and another intern to do a beer run during my internship and the other guy wasn't even old enough to go buy alcohol. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in my 30s. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> So the MBA is what actually allowed me to feel like I could, like maybe it was a support, but it helped me make that transition in regards to going to an internship and starting on the bottom again to work my way up. But in regards to the actual courses that helped business strategy, as well as communication, the communication courses I took, pitching ideas and finance, I would say were the most helpful in regards to being um, in marketing, sorry, marketing as well to be helpful for product management. Okay, um, I think Chew Chewy asks, does pro the product owner need to have tech experience background in a SaaS company? I do think that they, um, that's a great question. From my experience, yes, but I've also seen where business analysts have turned into product owners and some of the best product owners. So business analysts, I didn't put that in that matrix that I showed earlier, if you will, but from my experience, they typically are looking at more the user requirements and from a, from a technical side. And so um, BAs tend to translate very easily into product owners um, from a career transition standpoint, if you will, if that helps at all. Okay, uh, Georgiana asks, how do you suggest managing the transition from product management to UX careers? And is that going from product management to UX, I'd assume? Yes. Yep. Okay. From a, from my experience, um, like right now, there are moments where I want to lean a little bit more towards the long-term product strategy and vision of being a UX designer. Um, but I work closely with the product manager. Actually, I'm with a project manager because I'm working directly with a customer right now. Um, so sometimes I just have to realize, hey, I need to step back. That's not my role anymore. But I've also been one that never thinks you should just stay in your own swim lane. It could be even from my architecture background. I worked at very small companies where there are four to 20 of us. Um, so at those companies, you had to take out the trash. You had to do all the little things that some people, I'll never forget when I started working at Q2, someone complained about the coffee and I just couldn't help but laugh because I was like, I have never worked at a place for 12 years that had coffee. And like the fact that someone was complaining about the flavor, I was like, really? Like, um, you got to just realize what you have. So I guess where I'm going with that is that I think that you should always be willing to lean over those swim lanes and help each other. Um, but I'm not ever trying to overstep the product manager. Just give them advice from the user experience standpoint where I might suggest the product to go. But the beauty now about where I am um, 
in a, in a UX design position, I'm not taking care of the support or maintenance of a product in production. Now I am still getting discovery feedback and making suggestions for where the product might go, but I'm not having to manage all of the like the war zone out there, if you will, of the product being in production and us having to make sure that it's like good to go every day, stable and scalable. Awesome. It looks like we have maybe question, uh, time for two more. Uh, so Kringle Garcia, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, it seems like product managers need to collaborate with numerous departments and need to have several considerations when making decisions. How did you best manage, balance your time and energy to do those activities? That is a great question, Kringle. I think that that's actually one of the hardest things about that role is that you are balancing so many different things. I am very much all about transparency. And one thing that worked really well where I previously was that is that um, in order to manage, I'm all about setting healthy boundaries as well, being a working mom. I mean, I have to, because for too many years, I didn't when I had babies and um, it was stressful. And so now I have to say, hey, at 3 p.m., I'm leaving because I have this activity or 4 p.m. I have an appointment. Reason why I go there is because instead of at allowing marketing to ping you at any moment via Slack or Teams or whatever you use, actually setting a recurring monthly meeting with marketing and sales to give them the updates on your roadmap, like owning the schedule and balancing it yourself so they know, hey, um, at this meeting, we're going to go over all of our updates, our progress, our plans, any problems we're experiencing so they know how to, sales and marketing knows how to communicate that. Um, if you get ahead of it and manage that schedule yourself, then others aren't managing it for you. And what I had is if any marketing folks or sales folks would come to me with questions, I would ask if that's something we could put on the next agenda or when they needed an answer by knowing that, hey, I can't do this right now, but because there's a chock full of back-to-back -back meetings today. Um, but on Friday, I have 15 minutes where maybe we could touch base. Um, so really taking that initiative to manage your own schedule, I think is very important. Amazing. Thank you so much, Christy. And there was a question that came in from Sandra that um, uh, she had to repeat, but it actually is very similar to Kringle's question regarding uh, she's had some experience with product owners and managers who were making decisions, design decisions without including her uh, from a UX perspective, and they didn't really understand the value of design. And so it looks like she was asking, how do you deal with situations like that? And uh, she's tried talking and educating and layers up and, and doing things like that. But uh, just wondering if you have any quick tips on anything like that, besides what you've already just mentioned. Great question. And I'm sorry you're experiencing that, Sandra. What I have learned um, being like eight years or I guess technically seven into UX design and product in general, um, I feel like we still on the UX design side are still educating. And so um, having a deck at any moment to potentially explain this is how we perform discovery. This is why it's valuable. So even at your design reviews, if that week you're explaining, like maintaining those consistent design reviews, I think is really crucial because you might not have necessarily a wireframe to show that day, but you have feedback from the users that you want to go over. Um, also including um, product and developers in all research. I always recommend asking them to at least attend one session, if not all, so that they can experience that empathy. So that when you have a lead dev pushing back on like, that's not valuable, or why would we ever do that? I've noticed that when they go to those discovery sessions, they typically have a lot more empathy and understanding as to that user. So when you bring up the persona, Joey or something, for example, um, they're like, oh, I remember when at this session they talked about this and they just have a little bit more of that connection to the product. So I feel that um, incorporating product managers, owners and developers there um, and asking for you to also have a seat at the table. Like if when there's ever a product decision meeting going on and I'm not a part of it, I asked to be a part of it or asked to be a part of it in the future, not only so I could be looped in, but take that information away from those meetings and iterate and come up with an idea of how we can solve a problem together. That's so helpful, Christy. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so sorry to everyone that we didn't get to your questions uh, towards the end, but we're over time. And I know Christy has two meetings that she needs to juggle at this point. Um, thank you so much, Christy. This was so powerful and so insightful and so helpful. And thank you everyone who joined. I know there's several different time zones on here and we're at middle of the night for some folks. So thank you so much for participating. 
the recording is going to be posted on ADP List's website and their YouTube page. So if you missed something or if you just want to listen to this again, uh, definitely feel free to check that out. Thank, Thank you. And thanks everyone for your time. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn and reach out if you have questions. Yes. Have a good one. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.